God good? His mercy and His goodness. God is so good to us. Thank the Lord once again for opportunities to stand before His people and preach the word. We thank you for being here once again. A long week we've had, but you've hung in here. Scripture reading will be coming from Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Malachi chapter 3, verses 18 through, verse 13 through 18. I'll be reading from the King James. You may have the NASB or the NIV or the New England Translation. Your words have been styled against me, said the Lord. Yet you say, Why have you spoken so much against me? Ye have said, It is vain to serve the Lord. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy and blessed. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that fear the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him, before them that fear the Lord, and that thought and meditated upon his name. And they shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels. And I spared him as a man spared his own son that served him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. You may be seen. So today we find ourselves still in the condition of the heart. In the book of Malachi, Malachi's burden, prophecy was written because God loved the people. God shared his love with the people in verse 2, chapter 1. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. God did it not because they were good, but God did it because he's good. And in proof it, he says, listen, let me show you what I did to Esau and his, his descendants. Not Esau himself, but his descendants. I laid their, their wasteland, their land of wasteland for the jackals and for all the different wild animals. And even to this day, you can never find Edom anymore because it doesn't exist. But God said, look what I have done for you, Israel. I have made you my own. I have chosen you, not because you were great, not because you was good. You was the smallest of all the nations. But I chose you to put my glory there. I chose you because I'm good. And because I'm God. And because I love. And then God shared with them about what happens when they shift their hearts away from God. And it's very easy to do in a time like this because we're looking at uh, what's going on in the world and we can shift away from God because we're, we're trying to make our, uh, the very first and last dollar, the very first and last dollar, the very first and last dollar, and we, it's a continuous process. We're always doing it. We're always working. We're always trying. We're always trying to gain, trying to get more than we have. Sometimes we have more than we need. And our hearts shift away from God for a moment. A moment may be a day, a month, a couple of years. Until God brings us back to ourselves. And even when we shift our hearts from God, sometimes in the shifting we become unfaithful to God. Everybody but God. God is last. Everything is first. God gets our leftovers. Whatever the leftovers are, we give them to God. Leftover bread, leftover food, leftover money, leftover praise, leftover worship. Whatever it is, we give it to God. Whatever the leftover is, God gets it. But then God has to show us who he is in Malachi chapter 3. For I'm the Lord, I change not, verse 1. Therefore, you sons of God, Jacob will not consume. He says, listen, I'm doing these things to show you just who I am. Because if I didn't show you who I was, who I am, you forget 
how far I brought you. Yeah. It's easy to get how far God brought us when we go into our homes and we have uh, food in our refrigerator, when we have a lot of clothes in our cars, a lot of shoes that we can put on our feet. We have cars that we can drive. We have a little bit of change, that my mom called it change, in the bank. <laughs> it's easy to forget then all about God, isn't it? When, when we have so much. But God said, let me tell you who I am. You should forget how far I brought you. Then he says all that, and he says, listen, don't forget to give me uh, your best when you bring your tithes and offerings to me. I don't want your leftover change. I don't want your leftover thinking. I want your best. And if you can't give me your best, then don't give me anything because I really don't need what you have because the cow on a thousand hills is mine. Everything you see, I created it. As far as your eye can see, I've done it. It's mine. I own it all. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In case you forgot, he said, even those that dwell therein are mine. Because I made you in my own image and my own likeness. And then you shifted away from me. And you were unfaithful to me. And you were giving me your leftovers. And I'm your best. Let me stop here and give you a prayer because some of you are already excited. I'm going to bring you in a little deeper, right? right. And now, Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for opportunities. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being God. Thank you for your people who are listening to your word. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to preach what thus said the Lord. Help me decrease that you might increase. Let me preach your word with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven that all our hearts may be touched and all our lives may be changed. We thank you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So God then moves us, the prophet moves us in verses 13 to 18. And guess what he does? He uses a contrast. There's a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. There's a contrast between the obedient and disobedient. Between the faithful and the unfaithful. Between the living and the dead. I'm talking about those who are dead in trespasses and sins and those who are alive from the dead because they receive Christ as Lord and Savior of the life. That's the only way we're living because we receive Christ. If you can breathe and praise God, you're living because Christ has put life in you. So he gives the contrast. And contrast is a pretty neat argument. Some of them like black and white. You know, black and white are contrast, but yet they go together, don't they? I got on my black and white suit with my tie and my shirt, and um, I'm not, my suit is not white, black and white, but my shirt is and my tie is. And I'm, 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 I'm sporting something. I'm really in it. A contrast, but yet it's complimentary. But everything that contrasts don't go together. The wicked and the righteous can't go together. The unsaved and the saved don't go to the same place. The unfaithful and the faithful don't get the same thing. That's the contrast he says here. When he gets into the contrast, he says in verses 13, you have stopped, spoke stoutly against me, or harshly against me. I'm still introducing you to the text. He said, you spoke stoutly against me. In other words, they told God that they were, they had impiety towards God. That means they have no reverence for God. If you speak stoutly against God or harshly against God, you really don't have no reverence for God. And some of us are like that. We talk to God any old way. And you say, but I really haven't. Yes, it is. When you say, God, I need you to do whatever. God don't have to do anything. Because right. that's not check. God is God and God alone. Amen. And God didn't check out and leave you in his place. Amen. So therefore, they spoke stout words against the Lord. They had impiety toward the Lord. They impugned the Lord. I-M-P-U-G-N-E-D. You know what it means? It means to attack, attack the Lord. They attack the Lord in verses 14 and 15. You know what they said? You know what? The, the wicked are proud and they are blessed. And, 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 and God, look at them. And, and, and look what's going on with them. And they, they impugn the Lord and, and attack his justice and his holiness. Some of us, when we see the wicked prosper, when we see money going into the wrong hands, when we see people who can say anything and do anything and they don't care they can get in any trouble, but if you just say one thing on your job, they want to fire you, tell me you don't say, Lord, how are the proud blessed? Yea, they work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that till God even delivered. Even the ones that call your name by another name are still blessed and delivered. And we say, Lord, how can this be? We're speaking. 
and imputing God. Like God doesn't know what's going on. That's the part of who God is, right? God knows what's going on. God knows just who he is. God is the only person said John McCarthy knows everything that he knows. You get the contrast. Then he moves us to verse 16 and 17 and 18. This is where we land ourselves. This is where we find the obedient heart. It's the contrast between the rebellious and the obedient. It's the contrast again between the wicked and the righteous. It's the contrast between those who are going to serve God and those who are going to play like they're serving God. All right. Listen to this introduction. Jeremiah 24, 7 says, I will give them a heart to know me. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, Moreover, I will give them a new heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is a changed heart, renewed by the blood of Christ, revived by the Holy Spirit, and refreshed by the joys of salvation. It's a heart that beats with 10,000 heartbeats, in which no clinging sounds of an unsaved world can drown out, because it's fueled by the eternal spirit and the living word. This heart loves to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. It loves to make a joyful noise and to come before his presence with singing. It loves to lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. It loves to praise him with the whole heart, worship towards his holy temple and praising him for his love and kindness. If you're quiet enough, you can hear a heartbeat again. Boom, 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 boom. Somebody came today to worship God. Somebody came today to lift up holy hands. Somebody has a heartbeat for God. Somebody's obedient to the Lord. And if you listen close enough, that's a heartbeat right there. Somebody who really wants to watch, lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. word. If you listen closely, that was singing loud and clear. That heart was not beating excitedly for Jesus. Somebody has a heartbeat for God. And I don't know who you are, but you might be holding back. But when you think about how God has been good to you, the heart beats just a little louder. When you think about how God set you free, the heart beats a little louder. When you think about God came, brought you through the life, the heart beats a little louder. Somebody has a heartbeat in the church for God. And when you think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, there's a heartbeat going on.
praise God is now. And so the word now means to now. It means to give God praise now. Because you don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. You don't know how, what tomorrow's going to be like. And so they give God praise now. So then now is the acceptable time. Now is the time for us to awake out of sleep. Some of you are still sleep. You know the word sleep means it needs to be insensitive to the things of God. That's Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Some of you are insensitive to the things of God. You know how I know? Because when your heart is beating and God has blessed you, you you're still be excited about praising God. And I don't have to tell you to praise God. Why? Because you're not insensitive to the things of God. You're not sleeping at the wheel. You're wide right awake. You know how good he's been. You've seen it in your sister's life. You've seen it in your brother's life. And yes, God has a way of taking us from nowhere. God has a way of lifting us up. You can, I can tell you God is good. And so I wake out of sleep, my brothers and sisters, because now is the time to praise God. He tells us why. He said, now your salvation nearer than when you first believed. He said, listen, Christ can come back at any time. And you sleep on Jesus. You can go to sleep on some boring shows. You can go to sleep on some boring things, but never on Jesus. He's not boring at all. I'm talking about he's not boring at all. How can you go to sleep on a man who died on Friday, was buried, stayed there at Friday night? This is the old preacher, preacher. Stayed there at Friday night, stayed there all Saturday, stayed there Saturday night, but all Sunday morning, he got up with all power. How can you go to sleep with a man who has all My heart is beating. Yes, I'm trying to hold it back, but the Holy Spirit said, now nah, i got to push you a little further. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's time to wake up and sleep. Yeah. Quit being insensitive to the demands of Christ on your life. If Christ tells you to teach somebody, teach somebody. If Christ tells you to witness to somebody, witness to somebody. If Christ tells you to give, give. If Christ tells you to love, love. If Christ tells you to forgive, forgive somebody. Quit falling asleep on Jesus. Yeah. Time to wake up. Now it's the time to wake up and sleep. Now it's time to draw near to God. Amen. Some of you are so far away from God because we're doing some things that God told us not to do. Amen. Not that God moved, but me moved. And James said, listen, draw near to God. And then he tells us how to draw near to God. He said, you got to have pure heart and a clean hand. Purify, clean it up. Draw near to God. And then he says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, verse 10, James 14, and he will lift you up. You got to draw near to God. The more you draw near to God, the better you feel. The more you draw near to God, the better, the better it is. The more you draw near to God, the excited you get. The heart beats a little heavier, a little louder, a little quicker because you're drawing near to God. It's almost like somebody who met their girlfriend for the first time. And every time you get closer, you get a little nervous and your heart beats a little faster. <laughs> draw near to God and watch your heart get excited. Draw near to God. And watch God move on your behalf. Draw near to God and watch God change your circumstances. Draw near to God and watch God do some things in life that nobody else can do. My wife loves me, but Christ loves me more. And as I draw near to God, then I draw near to her. Now it's time to draw near to God. Number three, now it's time to walk in the way of righteousness. That's what the proverb would have said. He said, walk in righteousness. Now, you know what it is, but you got to live it. You got to walk in it. See, it's not enough for somebody to tell you what rightness is. It's not enough for somebody to tell you to love. I don't have to tell you to sing anymore. You know it's righteous to sing. Why are you holding back on God? You know it's righteous to praise God. You know it's righteous to give God all that he deserves. Why are you holding back on God? Walk in righteousness towards your brothers and sisters. Amen. I wrote something down. But now it's time also to walk in a good old way. In case y'all write it down, it's time to walk in the way of righteousness. It's time to walk in the good old way. But we don't want to walk there. Jeremiah 6, 16. And we don't even know what a good old way is, do we? It was a great body. He wrote, lift every voice. He just bring out two standards. He tells us the way. James, Wells, and Johnson. He said, we have come on a way that with tears have been watered. Yeah. We have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughter. That's the way. It's a good old way. Man, but that's a tough way. But if you walk that way, Jesus Christ will be there with you every step of the way. 
Because he said himself in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So if you walk that way, Jesus Christ will be with you every step of the way. There's some tears that way, I know there is. There's some blood that way, I know there is. Maybe it's the blood of Jesus Christ. He's making a path for you, but if you walk the good old way, Is your heart still beating? Yes, Are you excited about the Lord? Yes, sir. I think I hear your heart beating. Yes, sir. Let's move for a moment of that obedience, too. The motivation for the obedience. He tells us that they that fear the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord heard. In heart. What was the motivation? The fear of the Lord is their motivation. And what did they do when they thought about the goodness of God, his awe, his reverence, the fear of the Lord? That's what it means. It doesn't mean to be quaking in our boots. It means that we, we fear the Lord. We have reverence and awe for God. And so therefore, when they feared the Lord, they talked about the goodness of God. Have you ever just talked with saints about the goodness of God? Have you just got together and talked about how God has opened doors that no one else can open for you? Have you talked, got together with saints and just said, man, I remember when we didn't have no food and how God brought us from a... I remember how God delivered us. Man, isn't Jesus good? Man, you know, last night, I was just... That's how we do when we get together. That's what they did. They talked to one another. These are the obedient people. They have an obedient heart. They're talking one to another. And isn't it good when the saints get together and talk about the goodness of God? I can imagine, I would, that their conversation, I can imagine their conversation like the saints of old. They talk about how God made a way out of nowhere. I'm talking about the Egyptians now. This is who we're talking about. The Israelites, this is who we're talking about. But the saints of old, our saints of old too, right? Because remember how God made a way out of nowhere? They, they was on their way out of Egypt and the Egyptians were pursuing them and the Red Sea were before them and God made a way out of nowhere. I can imagine that's what they're talking about. And then they got into the promise land. Remember how they got into the promise land? And I can imagine they said, you remember how God brought us from a mighty long way? And then they set their feet in the promised land. And then remember said, how the Lord set our feet on solid ground. I can imagine them talking like that. And how God made our enemies the footstool. And how God, and how God worked it out for us. I wrote this down because I want you to get it. And I can imagine them saying, if it wasn't for the Lord on my side, where would we be? And I can imagine them even saying with John Newton, tis grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears believe. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangerous toils and snares, we have already come. Tis grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. I can imagine the saints getting together talking about God, and you talked about God, and you're still talking about God. How God kept you last night. How God woke you up. How God put food on your table. How God put clothes on your back. How God was a friend that took across the road. I can imagine you talking about God with some of your Christian friends and saying, nobody, can't nobody do me like Jesus.
greatest of God. Do you know that God is great?
to make us sparkle more. Then he says, the greater the heat, the purer the gold. The harder the washing, the wider the garment. So gold has to be purified so it can mark, sparkle and shine. Silver has to be purified so it can sparkle and shine. Diamonds have to be purified before they can sparkle and shine. But I like the pearl. I like the pearl. And the process of the pearl is this. What happens in the oyster is that some grain Dirt, a food particle, gets into the pearl between the mollusk and the man. And, and in there, the pearl, the oyster, is irritated. And because the oyster is irritated, he puts out a cycle thing called the creep in layers. And it lays over and over and over until a pearl is formed and the irritation stops. I like the pearl. You know why? Because some of us 